Well, it's good to be with you again tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Um, and however you access the Word of God digitally on your device, or if you have, like me, an, uh, the old-fashioned analog, uh, please just open your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to be there in just a moment, looking at uh, verses 7, uh, probably down to verse 13. Um, it has been such a joy to be with you all, and thank you for how you have made me feel so welcome. But I also want to say a couple of things about some special people that um, are behind the scenes tonight and have been behind the scenes all week, and they're really behind the scenes all the time here at Christ Mission Church. Um, I just want to say thank you to Rufus and Carson and Tim back there. They have been stalwarts every night uh, to make sure that they have my PowerPoint up and they've just been great to work with and click the slides and do all of that. So um, would you guys just give a round of applause to those three guys back there? They are just such a blessing. What you guys do uh, matters and they've also helped with the live stream and uh, there's just so many so many wonderful things, and I've, I've really been impressed with the church here. There are some great servant leaders here, and the ways that you all serve and the ways that you do ministry is just such a, such a refreshing thing and such a blessing to be able to see, and thank you for allowing me to be able to see that. So let me begin tonight the way I've begun the last uh, three lessons, and that is with a reminder to you that the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. Because the gospel invites sufferers and sinners to be set free from the guilt and shame and to find rest in the unchanging, unfathomable, unconditional love of God. The gospel announces to broken people, people burdened by their many regrets, that Christianity is not for people who try hard. It is for bad people who have finally given up. The good news of God's grace carries the power to give hope to the hopeless and to point all of us to the relief and the freedom of the cross. And it's at the cross that we're allowed to be able to take off our masks, where we don't have to perform, where we begin to learn that God's love and acceptance is forever fixed, and that there is nothing that we can ever do to cause God to love us more. I used to think that the gospel was for people who were out there. For lost people out there. Not saved people. I thought the gospel was for the world. That once you obeyed the gospel, you didn't need the gospel anymore. Um, I remember in the church that I was baptized in... Um, Many years ago, we would bring in preachers from out of town. We call them gospel meetings. Um, in the acapella churches, we wouldn't call them revivals because we were afraid people in the world would get it confused with the denomination. So we called them gospel meetings. Most of the time, we would invite an out-of-town preacher to come in and preach all week, and then we would bring our friends and try to get people who were outsiders and unchurched to come and, and, and listen to the sermons. But Paul, whenever he would preach in the first century to churches, he would remind Christians time after time after time of the gospel. And, and, and we often think that, that, that the gospel is something that we preach when we want to see baptisms or when we want to see restorations. When the reality is, the church requires the gospel as much as the world does. We need to be reminded that the gospel is good news 
for us too. And maybe at some places for far too long, we have treated the gospel as something for people out there. But the gospel is for us in here too. All of us need the gospel and need to be reminded that the gospel is good news because it is what we preach and it is what we must preach if we want to see people live out their baptisms. If you weren't here and haven't heard the news, maybe some of you came in a little late, uh, but Luke Sutton was baptized around 5.10 this afternoon. And yes, that is a great thing to be able to celebrate. And, um, and that's been three baptisms that I've had a privilege of being able to witness since I got here on Saturday. Um, and it's, it is such a blessing. Because the gospel is good news to the church, and it's good news to the saved, and it's good news to the world, and we need it as much as the world does. Because whenever we see a baptism, it reminds us the gospel is good news. Because it is only when the good news is restored to the church that the good news can be lived out by the church. So it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to see. So, Mark chapter 6. Context of Mark chapter 6. Jesus has, has gone to his hometown. And he's been rejected. Um, and by the way, that early part of Mark chapter 6, probably verses 1 through, one through 6, uh, basically teaches us that just because you stop listening to Jesus, that's not going to stop him speaking to somebody else. And Jesus may be rejected, but Jesus will never be silenced. And it also seems that this trip that Jesus has taken earlier in John 6 has convinced him that his ministry also, it's time for his ministry to be multiplied. And he gives the disciples their first assignment in their life's mission. So, Let's begin with verse 7 and read all the way down to verse, uh, uh, it says 13 up on the screen, maybe just verse 12. This is from the New Living Translation. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not even to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick, anointing them with olive oil. So Jesus is discipling his disciples in the mission of disciple making. And this is a really great reminder to us as it comes up on the screen that the mission of making disciples is core to our mission as God's people. The mission of making disciples is core to our mission as God's people. Um, now, the word discipling sometimes can make people a little nervous. Um, and and in, a two, in a couple ways. One, um, there have been people who have used the word discipleship in a context, in such a way as to, um, has to almost be spiritually abusive. Well, in some cases, to be spiritually abusive. But that's, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Um, and there are even people who would say, well, the whole idea of being a disciple really isn't a biblical concept. 
which to me is a little bit of a head scratcher because when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, as it comes up on the screen, here is, here is what Jesus says. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. Now, if Jesus used the word disciple, um, I think that's a good word. And, and, and by the way, in, in Matthew 28, verse 19, um, the word disciple is a verb. Make disciples is a verb. Now, when you look at that text in verse 19, um, what do you think is the command in that verse? Tim. Well, then, amen, you're getting good preaching. That's right, make disciples. The command is not go. Because in a lot of places where I've been, and a lot of churches that I've been a part of, People would say, well, the command in that verse is, is, is just go. That's not the command. The command that's in that verse is make disciples. Now, the first word in many of our translations, like the New Living Translation and the NIV and others, is, is the word go. But in the original language of the New Testament, that word is a present participle, which means it is not a command. Translated in a very literal way, here's what that verse would sound like. As you are going, make disciples. Because Jesus knew we would be going. The command is not to go. The command is, you be on mission wherever it is that God sends you. Wherever it is that you're going. Because all of us are going somewhere tomorrow. Maybe even tonight. And the command is to be intentional about what you are doing wherever you are going. Because make disciples is a verb. It is something we do. And by the way, discipling is a teacher reproducing himself or herself and his or her students. That's a, that's a simple definition of discipling. As a matter of fact, Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 6. He said, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Now, that is discipling. We got anybody in here who's a school teacher or maybe a former school teacher? Okay, school teachers are disciplers. Anybody in that, that, that you are able to take what you know about a certain subject and reproduce that knowledge in your students? How many of you here have been coaches in the past? Coached any sport? Okay. Coaches, you're disciplers. You take what you know about the game and you carefully spend time with your players to be able to teach them certain skills and abilities. How many of you are parents, grandparents? Raise your hand. You're disciplers. You're disciplers. You are pouring into your children and grandchildren good things and life lessons to be able to help shape their hearts. And all Christians, all of us who belong to Jesus, all of us who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit when we have been baptized, when you are obedient to Jesus, you become a disciple. And when you become a disciple, there is never a moment in your life where you stop being discipled. It is a lifelong process of being conformed into the image of Christ. You know, it was a privilege to see Luke being baptized. And Luke, one of the things I tell you is you will always be a disciple. There will be things over the next many decades, if it's the Lord's will for you to live, to be able to learn and know and grow deeper and deeper and deeper 
there are many Christians who have been, who, I, uh, just out of curiosity, is there anybody here who's been a Christian uh, 40 years? Raise your hand. How about 50 years? Keep your hand up. Any 60 years? 70. Okay, we have, a, we have a winner, 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 chicken dinner right here. Now, in your 70 years of being a disciple, are you still learning? In your 60 years of being a disciple, are you still learning? Absolutely. And you still have that desire to learn. You wouldn't be here tonight. Um, discipling is a very biblical idea of helping one another shape our lives into the image of Jesus. And let me also say this. I think one of the challenges in our culture today with social media, 24-hour news, the access that we all have to immediate information, there are other things that are discipling us. And we have to ask ourselves, what is it that's discipling us? I know people who are more discipled by Fox News or CNN than I know who are being discipled by the Word of God. People who are discipled by a certain political party or a certain ideology more than they're being discipled by the Word of God. People who have more in common with someone who believes their political ideology than they have in common with the people that they go to church with Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And again, I'm not talking to the people on the right. I'm not talking to the people on the left. I'm talking to both of you. What is discipling you? Or a better question is, who is? Who is discipling you? Now, um... Let me kind of give you three principles about discipleship that I think we find here in this text. By the way, let me stop for a minute. Comments, questions, Any, anything you want to share? I've done a lot of talking so far, so tell me any ideas you've got. Anything you want to share? Okay. Yes, Corey. Gracie, did you have something to share? That's right. Well, I think that's a great point because I, I think it also uh, cautions us. I mean, you know, like the book of James talks about, you know, the book of James talks about the tongue so much and, and what we share and how we share it. And how that, you know, one of the things that, that I've been convicted of, at least in my life, uh, in my speech, is the recognition that, you know what, my speech either gives me an opportunity to give life or give death. What am I, how am I using my speech and making sure that it's edifying into the building up of other people and not to gossip and not to try to talk about somebody else behind their back, 
but to be able to ask, okay, if I am, if I am, would I want someone to say those kind of things about me? Would I want to share that kind of, would I want someone to share that kind of information about me with others? Gracie, that's a very mature comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That's right. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like it's like Peter, and uh, in, in John chapter six. Uh, John chapter six is one of the most interesting chapters I think in the Gospel of John, and one of the interesting chapters in the whole New Testament. Where Jesus has been, he's, 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 he's um, walked on the water, he's uh, begun the teaching about being the bread of life, and he begins to give this hard teaching to the crowd, and the crowd is like, wow, I don't know that we can listen to this or do this, and they begin to abandon him. And John chapter 6 is also, well, I'm sorry, just leave it, leave it, it's okay. I've left half of my Bible at other places I've taught. Um, and John chapter 6 is one of those turning points in the Gospel of John where Jesus has been riding this wave of popularity, but when you get to John 6, especially at the end of John 6, things are going to start to go down. He's not going to be as popular. And, he, and Jesus even asked the disciples in, in John 6, he said, do you want to leave too? Do, you know, at Jesus asked the 12. And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe that you're the Holy One of God. Now, I don't know that Peter fully understood what he was saying. But I tell you what, those are good words. Especially when we want to find out who, has, who, who will tell us truth. Where do we truly find hope and change? It's not in anything of this world. It is in the Word of God and it is in the person of God. It's in the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate your solid response to that. And I appreciate you being able to say with kindness, no, that's just not true. Because the world will try to tell us things that are contrary to the Word of God. And that's why we need to spend time in the Word of God to make sure that we understand what truth is, to be able to share it, not to just be able to store it within our hearts, but also to be able to share it with others. And that is a wonderful comment. Thank you. And thank you for encouraging us. Because a lot of us old people can learn a lot from people of your generation. And thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about three principles. And, Gracie, you're right. The first principle is principle of association. Jesus sent them. Um, because disciple makers go. They don't expect people to come to them. Um, this is a challenge that we've got at the church at Providence Road. Um, we're, um, um, we are constantly having conversation of, conversations among our staff about how do we help people understand. We shouldn't just sit around and wait for people to find us. That's not a biblical way of growing the kingdom of God. How do we go where people are? How do we empower and encourage our people to be able to go? And not just wait for people to come to us. Disciple making isn't usually a public or highly structured task. Disciple making is something that is best done in informal settings like in somebody's home. I got to tell you, I've been really encouraged in having different conversations with some of you to talk about the home Bible studies that I've heard about. 
the small groups that you're doing on Wednesday nights and the discipleship groups so much that you love them and have enjoyed them so much that for some groups, it's kind of a challenge to want to have to multiply. Not divide, <laughs> but multiply. And that, that says volumes about your church, and it says volumes about you, because it is in those small groups that um, the disciple-making is effective. L look at this text from Mark chapter 3, verse 14. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now, how did they get to do that? How did they know to do that? How did they get educated in that? Well, they learned from Jesus by walking on the roads with him. They learned with Jesus by sitting in the boat with him. They learned with Jesus by doing meals with him. By the way, there's a great book called Meals with Jesus. It's a store, it's a study really of the Gospel of Luke. It's written by a guy named Tim Chester. And Tim makes a really interesting and very compelling point that whenever you look at Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus spends time at the table with different groups of people more than he does anything. That it's at the table that he teaches. It is while they're sitting around the table sharing a meal together that they're able to enjoy fellowship together, that he is pouring things into them and sometimes even challenging the religious leaders while they're sitting enjoying table fellowship together. And the disciples are sitting with him in all of these meals and they are able to learn from Jesus. They're seeing how Jesus is interacting. They're talking with him. Because disciples aren't made in masses. They're made in individuals. And by the way, it is a time-consuming process. Those of you who are teachers, you know what it's like to be able to pour and pour and pour what you know into the hearts and minds of young people and know the effort and the dedication that that takes until a point when you see a student that all of a sudden the light comes on and they see because it takes time. You guys who are coaches, you know what that's like. Where you see a student and you have, or one of your players, and you know you have told them time after time after time that when a ground ball comes to them, don't just stick out your glove to the side. No, you pivot, to the, you pivot and put your body in front of the ball. Your coach tells you that time after time after time. And in a key play in the game, your player does it. But it takes time to learn that. Good, good parents know this. That it takes time. A lifetime for our children. Spending time to be able to impart what you know. And by the way, it means that we're going to spend time with people. That we associate with people as we point them to Jesus. And don't be like um, the children of Israel. Remember, remember your Old Testament history. That whenever the children of Israel went into the promised land. And they uh, took over the promised land. And they didn't do all that God told them to do. And they allowed certain people to stay in the promised land. And then before you know it, they're living next to, door to them. And then before you know it, they're intermarrying. Um, and then what ends up happening to the nation of Israel is Israel becomes more Canaan-like instead of Canaan becoming more Israel-like. And when you especially look at the book of uh, Judges and into First and Second Samuel, you really see the Canaanization of Israel. So I think that point about association that Grace was making is really important for us. It, it's not a call for us to withdraw from the world, but it is a point for us to be say, who is influencing who in your relationships? Who's influencing who in your friendships? Who are you discipling and who are you being discipled by? Um, so here's the second thing. 
There's also a principle of authority. Principle of authority. Now, whenever we hear, hear that word authority, we get a little nervous. But we should. Because first of all, remember where authority truly lies. What did Jesus say in the Great Commission? All authority has been given to who? Jesus. So, I got to tell you, it does make me a little nervous when I hear uh, disciples who are supposed to be slaves start talking about their authority. But a disciple's ability to influence anyone isn't in a title, but it's in our character and our integrity. And, And we have no right to be disciple makers unless our lives answer three questions. And here are three questions. Here's the first one. What's our motive? What is our motive? Because if we're going to have any ability or authority to influence anyone for Jesus, the first thing they're going to want to know from us is this. What's in it for you? What's the catch? Why are you doing this? And this is particularly true in a culture that is more and more suspicious of Christians and our story. Um, the people want to know, well, well, what's in it for you? Is what, what's, the, what's the hook in this? What, why, why are you doing that? And Jesus knew that. Think about the instructions that Jesus gave to them before he sent them out. He, t- he spends time telling them what they can take and what they can't take. And isn't it interesting, he kind of, he, well, he not kind of, he prohibits them from taking what may have been viewed as some necessary things. But inherent in their commission was a trust in God to supply all their needs. Because the minimum of provision was meant to call out a maximum of faith. And traveling light was one of the ways to get into people's lives. In those days, unlike today, it wasn't the duty of the visitor to search for hospitality. It was the duty of the village to offer it. And by the way, that is still the way it is in much of the Middle East today. The response of the citizens to the obvious needs of the disciples would be one indication of their receptivity. And the main reason, I think one of the main reasons that Jesus tells them, okay, don't don't take all of this stuff with you, is so that they could communicate to the people, we don't have a hidden agenda. So that their commitment to the mission would be obvious. That Jesus, I think, is encouraging disciples, hey, don't have an ulterior motive, but you can have an ultimate goal. And those are, 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 are different things. Because imagine the impression it would make if when they came to a town and uh, they're met at the town square, they always go to the town square, how it was done in the time of Jesus and still in the Middle East today is you would go to a place in the middle of town, the town square, and people would know you as a guest and then they would come out and invite you to come into their home. So imagine when the disciples came to this Times Square, or this square, it could be a Times Square, like New York City and certain big cities, I imagine. Um, but but an, a, a nice old couple comes and says, hey, you know, we don't have much room, but come, come to our house. And then over time, the more time that the disciples spend time in that town, and they are teaching people, and they're preaching, and then they start healing and driving out demons, They get noticed and they become local celebrities. And someone in the village who's rich comes to the disciples and says, Hey, I want you to come to my house. I tell you, I got a big house. We got got private bedrooms for you. And we've got plenty of room. And we're in a really safe part of town. Come, Come on, come on to our house. And then the response of the disciples to that is, well, thank you, but you know what? We really didn't come here to be, to be pampered, so you know, thank you for your hospitality, but, but we're going to stay with this old couple. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, imagine the impression then that it makes that when they leave and the people of the town 
out of appreciation and out of love because they've kind of gotten close in the last few weeks, wants to say, okay, here's some cash and some money for you guys to get to the next place and here's some food and, 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 and we, want you to, we want you to have this. And disciples say, well, you know, we really appreciate this, but thank you, but, but that's not what we come for. This, this is very kind of you, but this is not what we're about. We're going to the next town, and we believe that our God will give us everything we need. How do you think their message would have been received? I, and and this, is, this is Kent Massey, and I think I'll speak for my wife, Valerie, when I say this. For us, we're at a stage of our life where we're starting to wonder that is the clutter of things that we have accumulated robbed us of our authority. And, and, and what would it look like for us to kind of begin decluttering the, some of the things that kind of weigh us down? Because disciple makers and disciple, disciple makers are givers, not takers. In an environment where people aren't used to associating churches um, with, uh, with giving, what would it look like if, if or associating us, well, let me find out. Let me, let me rephrase that. How do I want to phrase that? In an environment where people aren't used to associating churches with just giving, how refreshing would it be for people not to have to wonder what are they wanting for me? Or what are they wanting from me? And, and how refreshing would it be? And, and by the way, at our, at our welcome uh, back home at, at church in Charlotte, one of the things we try to say every week is if you're a guest at our church, please understand we don't want anything from you. But we do want something for you. And that helps us start at a whole different place. Uh, because if we're going to have authority to influence lives, we're going to have to deal with that question with people. What's your motive? What's your motive? And here's the second thing. What's the message? What's the message? You know, uh, disciples don't create the message. We, we, um, we may be bearers of the good news, but, but, but we are repeating the message of our teacher, Jesus. We're not repeating our message. And what was Jesus' message? Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12. And they went and preached that people should repent. Um, a true disciple doesn't call people to themselves. A true disciple always calls people to God. And if we're going to call people to God... We're going to have to call them to turn around from whatever else they're following and whatever else they're worshiping and whatever else they're doing. You know, there are passages where people were called to be disciples of Jesus. And there is one word that shows up more than any other word in the Bible where people are called to follow Jesus, and here's the word. It's repent. Repent. Um. Do we feel comfortable with that message of repentance? Because that word repent is a confrontational word that speaks of sin and speaks of rebellion. And, um, and because I'm a people pleaser, there have been times I've kind of wanted to kind of spin it a little bit and I want to soften it to be able to say, well, you know, I know life's been hard on you, but Jesus can fix all that. Oh, he can but there is a place for us to be able to say that the reason life has been hard is because we ain't listened to God. My grandmother had a saying that she would often use, and of all the grandchildren, um, I think she used it with me the most. Uh, my grandmother was a, a five-foot-two cube of a woman with a cotton ball head. Um, but she was fierce. And here's what she would often say about us. Hard heads make soft rear ends. 
Um, and that's true for all of us. It's true for all of us. Um, I was listening to NPR uh, a couple years ago, and they were doing a, a story about a broadcast company in Finland that had a contest to see who could send in the most synonyms. And remember, a synonym is a word that means about the same thing as another word. Um, and the winner was a guy who turned in 740 different words for drunkenness. I mean, 740 different words for drunkenness. Um, and second place was for 170 different words for stealing. Third place was 123 different words for lying. Now, the point of the story was that, you know, we've become pretty good at finding ways of describing life in any kind of term except sin. We can clean it up, we can dress it up. I guess it's kind of like the old saying, you know, you could put uh, lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Um, but when Jesus is preached, there has to be a message of judgment as well as salvation. Because like we talked about last week, or last night, um, it can't be good news if people aren't convinced that there's some bad news. And we always end with the good news. Because we can't compromise the message of our teacher. Now, it will not be popular. And it wasn't popular in the days of Jesus, because what is the response to some of the people? What does Jesus say the response to some of the people will be? They ain't going to listen. And then what does Jesus tell them their response should be? Shake the dust off your feet and move on. I don't think Jesus in giving that advice meant that, he, that, that the disciples should not love these people, that they shouldn't pray for these people, but you've done everything that you can do. Um, we aren't responsible for how people receive the message, but we are responsible to be faithful in how we share it. And by the way, when we study the Word of God, our goal is not simply to know God's will. Our goal is also transformation of our hearts that creates the desire to carry out God's will. So, what's the message? And here's the third question. What's the mer where's the mercy? Where's the mercy? Isn't it interesting? Jesus is not sending them out to be ugly or to sneer or to, to pound people with the Torah over the head. Instead, who does he send them out to? He sends them out to hurting people. Look at verse 13. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That they go where people are hurting. I once heard a preacher say one time that whenever you preach to the hurting, you'll always have an audience. That's a true statement. Um, they saw disease as one manifestation of Satan's power. And isn't it interesting? They don't see preaching and medical missions as two different works. Um, and it's almost as if authority is granted to people who show compassion. And we take this message, but we take it with a heart ready to break because of the, the brokenness that we encounter because of the people that, we're, that, that we are called to spend time with. Because we have no right to preach to the soul of man if we don't care for the whole of man. It's like somebody once said years ago, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So we have to deal with this, with this question of authority, that if we want to be people with influence to change our community, that we have to be people with no hidden agendas, we can have... And uh, no ulterior motive, but we can have an ultimate goal. And also, we are people who take the message of our Lord with tender and compassionate hearts. Um, 
I look back, I, I talked to you earlier about gospel meetings, and one of the things as I was thinking about this today as I was driving, that um, when I think about some of those gospel meetings and hearing preachers preach about hell, it hit me today that most of those sermons that I heard being preached about hell were preached by men who seemed to enjoy it. I don't remember one where the preacher ever wept a tear or cried a tear. And, and again, I'm not trying to be condemning of anyone, but let's take the message of the Lord with tender and compassionate hearts. Because tender and compassionate hearts doesn't mean we water down the message or make it less. But maybe having that tender and compassionate heart allows us to be able to enter with greater integrity and to build a bridge that, we've got, that we want to walk across and help them walk back to, to Jesus. And here's number three. Um, another principle of disciple making is accountability. Now, this is a good word, but this is one another one of those words that you know just kind of kind of makes us uncomfortable sometimes. And and part of it is because we have seen or we have heard of abuses of this, especially in churches and and in other groups of people who, uh, who are claiming to follow God. But it's still a good word. Let me ask you this question. Why do you think Jesus sent the disciples out two by two? What do you think? Yes, Carson. Yeah, you know, it's a whole lot easier to have somebody there with you to encourage you and to keep you on task, on mission. It's a great point, Carson. What else? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that there's, there's safety in numbers. There's that um, uh, being able to make sure that, you know what, we're taking care of one another. Um, what else? Yes. Mm hmm That's right. Because remember the context, too, of Mark chapter 6. The story immediately before this is Jesus being rejected in his hometown. And, and you got to wonder, and, and, and that had to sting for Jesus. Sting. Um, and he knows that there are places where the disciples are going to be rejected and refused, and they're going to need some of that moral support and encouragement and reminder to stay on mission, like Carson said, and a reminder to keep one another out of trouble and to be able to have that accountability with one another. Isn't it interesting, too? Um, I know that you're studying Acts in some of your uh, small groups, but isn't it interesting that in the book of Acts, how the missionaries most always traveled in teams. You don't see many missionaries in the book of Acts going out solo. Um, because effectiveness is increased with companionship, counsel, and cooperation. And let me just put this out there and ask you to give you some mental bubble gum. Um, Maybe our discipleship has been hindered because we are afraid of being vulnerable and open to one another and being able to share our burdens with one another. Um, after 30 years of ministry, almost 30 years of ministry, um, here's an observation I've had about church life. That sometimes the people in our congregations who are the weakest are those who develop relationships with other believers only at assembly time on Sunday morning. That there's, no associate, there's little to no association during the week. 
And what would it look like for us as a community of believers? And how does it help us with our discipleship and our evangelism for the world to be able to see a community that, that is safe for us to be able to share with one another and to be vulnerable with one another? Because each one of us are accountable to Jesus. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. By the way, um, I did some teaching uh, a while back, well, a couple years ago, um, on heaven. Um, it's about a 10-week series, I think. And, um, and here's something, and this is just a little bit of holy imagination, so just I don't want to present this as, as this is the way it is or, or any of that. But I can't help but wonder. If heaven doesn't have a big IMAX theater where God invites us to come and sit with him and he shows us scenes out of our lives where we have been faithful and scenes out of our lives that we have been true to the mission that he's given us and that what we did in order to be faithful to Jesus has had implications and impacts that we had no idea and the Lord wants to sit there with us and show us what our faithfulness and our obedience did that we had absolutely no idea of. And wouldn't that be a cool thing? Um, because, you know, I, and, 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 and being praised by the Lord for our obedience. Uh, because I don't think when we get to heaven, you know, uh, the only praise that we're going to, that, you know, we will certainly spend time praising God uh, for all of eternity. And he deserves it. And we can't give him enough praise. But does it ever stop you in your tracks to think God's going to spend some time praising you? He's going to spend some time praising you. Um. Any other comments, questions? What else? What else you see? And then I want to give you a couple of take-home truths. Yes, ma'am. Amen. And I, I love that, Heather, and thank you for sharing that. And by the way, you know, um, why do you think Corey and Anna wanted to get back here? We didn't want them to leave North Carolina. I got to tell you that. We did not want them to leave North Carolina. Uh, but there's something about the church here that allows that. You know, and, and, and you all are living out what Jesus talked about in the verse that we looked at earlier uh, out of Mark chapter 8, that, you know, I'm going to give you houses and lands and, fa and families. Uh, and, and, and look what he's done. He's been true to that. And, and by the way, that, um, that comes with unity. It doesn't mean uniformity. I'm sure you all don't agree on everything. But, but you agree on, on the main thing of Jesus and who he is and what it means to follow him. Um, 
And by the way, that unity is something that needs to be zealously and jealously guarded. Um, there, are, um, there are many people in our community who will die even tonight by a variety of ways. Uh, there will be people who will uh, who may be going home tonight. Another car coming the other way and crosses the center line and hits them head on and they die. Um, there could be people who die of violence in our community. Someone who may be shot or stabbed. Could be even an accident where somebody falls off their roof. Um, but none of those are the number one killer in our community. The number one killer in, in our community is heart attacks, strokes, cancer, those diseases where the body begins to turn on itself. That's the number one killer. And, um, and Jesus, I think, one of the things that I love just in knowing a little bit about the elders that I know here over the past few days and being able to talk with Corey uh, before coming and having the opportunity to talk with Jeff, I, I love that you have strong elders to be able to guard that unity. Because if that's the way it is with our physical bodies, that it, it's the number one killer when it begins to turn on ourselves, that's the way it is with, with the church body as well. So let me encourage you zealously and jealously guard that unity. And Heather, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, let me give you two take-home truths and we'll wrap up. I've gone a little long tonight, much longer than I intended. Uh, first of all, going always involves leaving. Now, that's not contrary to Heather's statement just a moment ago. Um, <laughs> Those who come to Jesus have to go for Jesus. And that doesn't mean you have to physically move. But it does mean that you make an effort among your neighbors and in the town that you live in. Um, like I said a few moments ago, um, maybe we have become so weighed down by so much stuff that we can't let go and be disciple makers. You know, isn't it interesting that the first century church seem to be just a caravan of pilgrims. And, and isn't it interesting, especially in the book of Acts, how much of the book of Acts is dedicated to the story of people who were on the move. And, and what happens to us that sometimes we move from a caravan of pilgrims to a company of squatters? Um, and Heather, you know, what she said was so beautiful. Because that's really the reason that I want to be in Charlotte. It's because I believe with all my heart that's the place where God wants me to make disciples. And if Charlotte isn't the place, then you know what? I need to be open to the call of the Lord. Um, that if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to spend our lives seeking where it is that God wants us to be. And that may mean Sometimes going involves leaving. But here's the second thing. Finding demands losing. Finding demands losing. Because saving others will always be at the sacrifice of self. Um, I, I love history. And I love the study of history. And I read somewhere one time that 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, five of those men were captured and tortured before they died. Nine of them died because of wounds that they received or injuries that they received in battle during the Revolutionary War. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked, destroyed, and burned. Two of them lost sons in the war. Two of them had sons that were captured. And when they signed their names to that paper, they were risking 
their fortunes, their lives, their families, and their futures. But no movement in the history of this world has ever lasted and made a difference by people who weren't willing to die and lose everything. And that is why Jesus invites us to come and die. Um, I heard somebody say at a conference once that a man can live with almost any how if he has a why to live for. And the conference speaker said, what's your why? And that's a really good question. Because I believe that disciple making is the most urgent task you can give your life to. But it's also the most demanding. And I don't think it's any mistake that the very next story in John 6, right in the middle of this chapter, the story of John the Baptist. And John or Mark tells us the story about the death of John the Baptist. And we know from other places that they come back and, um, um, and they share with Jesus, you know, about the death of John the Baptist. We're, you, know, you don't get that yet in John 6, but it's, it's later in the Gospels. Um, John, John is there because I think it gives us a great illustration of what happens with people who give their lives speaking the word of God. That, that John is almost an illustration of what happens to us when we faithfully answer the call of the kingdom. That John the Baptist is what it means to be a disciple maker. That, you know, for many of us, that, that's not going to end in death like it does with John the Baptist. But it, but it usually means hardship. And it always means you spend your life. One quarter at a time. Remember that $1,000 illustration last night? That, you know, you have $1,000, rarely are we ever asked to give that $1,000 up at one time. But we do spend it a quarter, 50 cents, a dollar at a time. And Mark is not going to let us get away from the call of the cross. Mark 8.35 is how we started. And this is how I want to end. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Because Mark doesn't let us forget that the man who loses his life is the man who saves it. And church at St. Robert, you have been so gracious to me. And thank you for allowing me the absolute privilege of being able to come and, and share these teachings with you. And to be reminded of that for myself. And the ways that you have taught me and the examples that you've given me and how I leave feeling so full of hope for the church here at St. Robert because of the work that God is doing in, with, and through you to not only bless this church, but also be a blessing to this community. Because I believe that God has this church in this place because there are, let's see, what's the population of St. Robert? 4,300, 4,400, something like that? Um, there are a few thousand people around in this community who need to be disciples of Jesus. And I pray for you to have the boldness to see them and then have the boldness to be able to reach them and the boldness to be able to speak grace and truth. Thank you for letting me be here and it has been an absolute honor. So can I pray with you before uh, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you and we praise you. Thank you for all the many ways you bless. Thank you that you um, invite us into this great mission, this great adventure of life, of making disciples. And thank you for the Christ followers that are here at this church. And Father, for those who are um, part of the, um, the congregation, Father, I pray that you will move them into committed. And for those who are committed, help move them into the core of being able to be disciples who make disciples. And Father, help us always keep the gospel in the forefront of our hearts and as an anchor for our hopes and as a, as a salve for our hurts. 
Help us to live lives in such a way that helps us to understand and live and know that the gospel is good news. And it's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Thank you, friends. You're dismissed. Thank you.